So good day, everyone. I'm Karen Bonadio, Director, uh, Karen, I'm Karen Bonadio, Director, um, Senior Director of Alumni Relations. And thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Becoming a PAA Client, featuring Kate Legu, Director, NPP Program, and her colleagues, Jack Donahue and Emily Rogan. Um, this is an opportunity for alumni to learn about becoming a client for the Master in Public Policy Capstone Project, the policy analysis exercise. Um, and Kate and her team will answer your questions on how second year MPP students can help tackle your relations problems. So take it away, Kate. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, the PAE process is a great way to sort of stay involved with HKS. So we're going to do a very, very quick couple of slides about the policy analysis exercise, what it is, what it isn't, what your role as a client would be. Um, but we're really hoping to kind of motor through that so that we can get to your questions. We find the questions are a great way to kind of unearth um, a lot of the nuance. So um, let's get to this presentation. What is a PAE? PAE, if you're not an MPP alum, um, if for the uninitiated, it's a policy analysis exercise, the capstone experience for the second year of the MPP program. Um, Students begin the process in September, and it is uh, a year-long process. Actually, our second-year students are getting ready to submit their PAEs next week. Um, the deadline is April 2nd, but they've been working with clients um, for the course of the year to define a problem and think about how it could be solved through policy. Um, they develop solutions um, for their client and then um, analyze the various options and propose a way forward. The final product is a sort of consulting report that's been bolted onto a master's thesis. So it is part research and analysis and part recommendations, um, usually around 40 pages. Turn it over to you, Jack. Great. And it's so nice to see all those faces, including some that I, uh, that I recognize very well. Um, and for those of you who are very, very aware of what a PAE is. I beg your indulgence as we go through uh, some of this for the, the folks from other programs. Um, PAEs direct, uh, address all kinds of policy topics. There's not you know, a narrow answer as to what makes uh, a good project. But one thing that's important is that the client actually cares about it, that it, it's not just something that you know, you're doing to you know, humor the students is something, you, you know, really matters to you and that it actually is a uh, specific policy choice rather than just what might be nice to noodle around with. Uh, it's also re really important that it's a choice where the right answer isn't obvious, but can be clarified, if not nailed, by uh, the application of the sorts of evidence and logic and analysis that we train MPPs to do. Um, and I think, again, the, the, the most important criterion uh, from the client's perspective is, is something you really need an answer to this. You care about it because, uh, you know, there are crucial roles that the client pl plays and, you know, she's not going to play those roles, not going to devote, uh, you know, her time and attention to it unless it is actually something that matters uh, for her leadership uh, practice. So I'm briefly going to cover what is not a PAE. And the first thing is that it's not, um, you're not getting a research assistant um, to work on something for you. Um, this is something that involves analytical skills. And as Kate mentioned, the students are going to come up with actionable recommendations. So it's a lot much, it's much more involved than a traditional research uh, paper. And we also don't want something that has a predetermined outcome or goal. As you can imagine, um, as, and as Jack mentioned, we don't always know what the outcome is, um, but it's something that you really want to get solved for your organization and something that you care about. Um, and then it also has to have uh, a small enough scope that is feasible to complete in a class over the course of the year, um, but also large enough that it is uh, a challenge for the, for the student and able to utilize the skills that they've learned. On avoiding the predetermined outcome, I actually remember uh, an episode that came up about 10 years ago where we had um, somebody, not an alum, submit a uh, proposed PAE project, and they were from the uh, Church of Satan, and they said, we want a, a student to, uh, to prove that promoting the Church of Satan would be a good thing for the United States, but I know you won't take this because you don't like the Church of Satan. We said, no, we won't take it because you, are, you have a predetermined uh, conclusion. 
Um, so uh, other than that, we're pretty wide open. Uh, so what is your role as the client? Uh, number one, enthusiastic participation. You know, you care about the uh, care about the answer. You're engaged in the project. I mean, the 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 student will put in orders of magnitude more time than the client. So I don't want to make it sound like this is a hugely burdensome role, but it's very important. And caring about it and showing you care is probably the most important thing. Uh, I think it's also important to uh, provide access to information that the student needs to, to finish the project. Um, usually that's pretty straightforward, but it is one of the more important things that a client needs to do is to be forthcoming with, uh, with what the, the student needs to actually engage with the, the analysis. Uh, I think it's also important to be um, candid and realistic in saying what you need. I mean, sometimes uh, this is maybe more a syndrome of non-alum clients, but uh, sometimes clients feel like they're doing the student a favor and that they shouldn't be picky and uh, just kind of let the student do what they want to do. That is absolutely you know, incorrect because for one thing, it's demotivating for the student if they feel like the the client uh, is just, you know, uh, humoring them, but also it, it it undermines the educational experience of of doing the PAE. If you're, you know, they're going to be the students are going to be facing careers of tough expectations on the part of the people they're working for, and uh, modeling that and giving the students some experience in that is a big part of the process. I think uh, a subtler aspect of the client's role, but one that's uh, important, is to recognize that you know the students. They're, they're kind of serving two masters. They are uh, doing their PAE as an official part of uh, the degree requirements for you know, a Harvard program, and there are some expectations that come with that, as well as being useful to the client. Now, if the Kennedy School is doing it right, and I think we usually do, serving the client's needs and meeting the intellectual specifications for, uh, the, for the degree program, uh, is something that naturally happens simultaneously. The clients do need to be aware that they also need to keep their uh, their advisors happy. And last, just a quick run through of the timeline. So we've mentioned a couple times that the PAE project is a year long project, which means that students are generally defining their project, choosing a client in the late summer and early fall. Um, so backing out from that means that we're um, the MPP team generally solicits projects um, from alumni and friends of the program, previous clients in the spring and summer so that they can be entered into our client database by the end of the summer, early fall. Um, so if you were to um, follow this link to become a PAE client, there's more information there. We'll cover all of it today. And there's also a link to a Qualtrics form um, where you would enter details about your project. And that comes to my team. Um, we take a look at it. And it will either go straight into the database or you may hear from one of us um, about, you know, if it does seem to have a predetermined outcome, you may hear from us. If it has no real policy component, you'll hear from us. Um, otherwise, you can expect that it will get entered into our database. Students are choosing projects and they'll reach out directly to clients. So you won't hear from the MPP team again. Um, instead, you'd hear from a student who is interested in talking to you more about the project that your organization is interested in. If you don't hear from anyone over the course of the fall semester, then it's what has likely happened is that a, not a, no student has picked up the project. It's in the database, it's active, but you know we have about 150 projects a year and many students source their own. So the next time you would hear from us would be in the very early summer. If your project does not get picked up, we'll reach back out and ask if you want to stay in the database for another season. You know, you may have in the course of that year figured out a solution and we can sunset the project and that's not a problem. Um, and if you want to stay in, that's also fine. So um, we will certainly reach out to you. You'll hear one way or another, either from a student in the fall or from the MPP team um, at the end of the spring, and then, you know, we'll chart a path forward from there. And that is that. Um, we are prepared to take your questions. Um, please feel free to use the raised hand feature. That is the easiest way for us to um, keep track of hands that are coming up. 
Um, and we'd love to hear from you about projects that are on your mind or how you might use an MPP student to solve a challenging problem for your organization. Peter, thank you for getting us started. Hi, so that was that was uh, perfectly brief and complete. So I appreciate that. Uh, the uh, so oh, let me let me there so that way I can scare off people that might be interested in working with me. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm a senior scientist at Mystic Aquarium and emeritus faculty in Department of Marine Sciences at University of Connecticut, and I work both you know on the cusp of science, well, works deeply in science and kind of on the cusp with policy fishery management, protected area, uh, marine protected area issues. So I'm wondering how uh, the extent that uh, client interest is focused on uh, environmental issues, ocean management issues, uh, and the policy arena that your students uh, address. Because there are some thorny kind of far-reaching yeah. issues related to, and the thing I'm thinking specifically about in terms of a potential uh, uh, interest of, of your department and students is the role that existing uh, the existing governance framework and policy around marine protected areas in U.S. waters uh, is has a bit of a, dis, a disjointed uh, set of goals related to President Biden's 30 by 30 America the Be Restore America the Beautiful initiative, and what uh, policy, what policy or legal changes would be required in order to meet it under various, like Magnuson Stevens Act, National Marine Sanctuary Act, Endangered Species Act, those kinds of things. So I got that was probably five or six questions all wrapped into one. You know, let me um, slightly reframe what I think you're asking, which is. Uh, are kind of broad, far-reaching topics fair game uh, for for a PAE? And I think the answer is yes. But one thing, um, it's not an academic paper, and it's not it's not this is not a you know uh, some professor writing a book about you know the way the world should work out. It actually the focus should be to some degree on what what the client should do, not what, you know, the rest of the world should do. And advocacy pieces can work, um, but it does need to be anchored. I mean, if, if, if you are, you know, part of an established, you know, especially organiza organization, uh, you know, giving advice and making policy proposals in an area, it is fair game to have a, a, a student involved in that. But that is what that would be. Yeah. You're part of a broad coalition of of uh, environmental NGOs that have that are working with with uh, uh, delegations on the hill yep. on 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 various issues. So this would be some you know uh, well and again realizing the the uh, the time constraints. Yep. You know, I, kind of a deep dive into the issues and making recommendations that might be actionable in order to try to move forward yes uh, with a broad see, coalition me, of, of groups let me seize on the word that you used actionable because i think that's very important what is not a particularly good pae is like how the world should turn out i right. think it be more what specific steps can specifically we already have that answer yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so i think what what would make a good pae would be you know here are you know, three options for the next stage in this policy arena, which of them is actually is is not just, you know, a, a good policy outcome, but is realistic in terms of the, the political landscape can be carried out by the organizations with operational responsibility. I mean, it, it really is important to make it real and just sort of sterile think pieces you know, every once in a while we have a PAE that turns into that, but it's not a good experience for any for all concerned. No, oh, I absolutely agree, and thank you, thank you for that ad 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 advice. Let's turn to David. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Um, well, I I was an MPA, so um, 
I don't really know about this, but I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Um, and as I understand, so you, you don't want a puzzle question like a PhD thesis, um, and you don't want external research, but, but let me ask you, um, you know, I'm, I'm on the board of a think tank that analyzes global problems and say there's something that we'd like to know more about, but do you call this research assistance if, you know, if we would ask them to evaluate emerging global um, regulatory and um, regulatory frameworks for artificial intelligence, for example, um, comparatively, U.S., Europe, other other places, and and what the likely consequences are. Does that, you know, it's not, we're not going to go out and regulate AI ourselves, you know, it's not an action for us, but um, could that fit, or is that too researchy? I think you'd want to put a point to it. Um, if if the much of the work is kind of surveying the landscape of AI policy, uh, but then I think that the, the question should be, what should your organization, what specifically should your organization support, advocate for? And where the, you know, the conclusion would draw on, again, not just what would, what would be nice to have happen in the world, but what's the array of political support and opposition? What's the uh, constellation of operational agencies that would actually have to make things happen? Uh, and then bringing that together with you know, policy desirability, what, what should be a specific agenda that your organization should support and what should they do to support it? I mean, mm -hmm. what coalitions do you try to organize? What legislators do you try to bring on board? It does need to be granular and action focused. But then it could work. Yeah, sure could. Um, okay, if, if I could ask one more quickly. Um, in my day job, I work in a software startup that does insider fraud detection and cybersecurity. Um, what about, but it's a private company, but what about an analysis of um, U.S. Um, government, military, changing policy on insider fraud, you know, since Snowden and all these things, and, um, you know, and what that opens up as opportunities for our company, or is that too private sector? I would say that's an edge case. It could work or it might not. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, we don't have, um, I mean, there's no barrier against uh, private companies as clients, but the focus mostly needs to be on, you know, on, I mean, it's a policy analysis exercise. And I think to the extent it's, um, you know, it's directed at how could we operate operate within this market to maximize revenue, that's just not a policy. I mean, nothing wrong with that. I'm glad that there are people, you know, working in the, in the software industry trying to do that, but it does need to be to hinge on uh, what's sound public policy. And if that overlaps with what would, you know, can make a buck for the client's company, that's just fine. But it, the focus does need to be on the policy issues. Okay, thanks. And and again, it's from September to May, basically, or? Right, okay, great, thank you. Okay. Up next is Ingrid, Master in Public Administration Class of 2020 and Orientation Leader for Fall 2019, one of my favorite people of all time. No pressure, Ingrid. No pressure at all, Kate. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Kate. Uh, I have three uh, quick questions. One is regarding uh, language. If clients can have a preferred second language in terms of it's not required, but it would make it easier for the student to understand the problem that is located in a different country. Uh, second, I saw on the website that uh, the like sort of requirement in hours for students, but how do you have a grasp on uh, the amount of hours that it would involve for the client, uh, like hours a week or a month or something? And last, I have a question regarding the scope. Um, so this, it worries me that uh, it has to be like a joint definition of when this ends. It ends in recommendations, in, it ends in the, a proposal, it ends in a prototype, and uh, what experiences have you had in that? Um, okay, so first question around the language. Um, I feel like I want to turn this one to Emily. Um, Emily, do you know whether students are looking for clients 
with this criteria in mind, especially when like secondary resources are likely to be in a different language than English. Um, are, are students navigating that at all in a way that's on our radar? I mean, this year with the faculty led project, we did have a faculty and a client who requested Spanish speakers on their project. So they would have easier access to the data and to um, the interviews that they were going to be doing. So yes, they're, I think that's fine to put into a proposal that you're, you know, looking for somebody with specific language skills. Sorry, Kate, was that, I'm trying to focus on the chat. But no, I know. I'm sorry. I realized no, I was drawing no, your attention away. Just say my name and, and you might have to repeat the question. I'm sorry, but you, uh, was that answering the question? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, particularly restrictive, the class, the group that's going to be doing their PAs uh, next year is roughly half non-US and more than half multilingual. Um, the hours for the client really vary. And I think it varies um, from client to client, but also like from stage to stage within the project. Um, I would imagine the sort of problem definition stage uh, and data gathering stage would probably be the most intensive for the client. But even then, we're really talking about, you know, hours per week, not uh, days per week. Um, I think that when the student is writing, that's probably the least intense time for the client, which is likely to be sort of from the end of the fall semester till around February, March-ish. Um, and then once the project is wrapped up, um, they'll want, the students will tend to want to present their findings to the client. So there'll be a little bit of time maybe beyond just the, the one point person, maybe a slightly larger group. Um, but I do think that the lift, as Jack said, like for the student is many orders of magnitude, uh, more hours than for the client. And Ingrid, I forget your third question. Uh, scope. Oh. Where does it end? Does it, end, does it have to end in recommendations? Can we like extend it to proposals, extend it to prototyping of a solution? Um. I might be very, very old fashioned, but when I hear prototyping, I'm thinking about a physical product um, and that feels like not a PAE. Um, there may be other ways to think about that. Um, Jack or Emily, do you, I, I mean, my my sense is that the sort of recommendations are themselves a proposal of a way forward. Um, it's possible I am not understanding the question, Ingrid, I'm sorry. I mean, we have, I, I recall, one PA a few years back where it, it was about uh, basically uh, digital communication with citizens and there was a recommendation and, and the student also did you know, a prototype of an app. But I recall that we said, you know, the 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 key is actually the policy recommendations and since this student actually knew how to build an app and that was kind of a nice plus had it just been build me the prototype in an app again a very worthy thing not a PAE yeah great thank you all right Colin all right thank you hi everyone uh, good to see some familiar folks including my PAE advisor Jack Donahue so thank you um, How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Uh, I my question is around. I feel like I have a number of useful potential topics, and I almost care as much about finding a student that's excited about doing the work and uh, getting engaged. So, do you have advice on how to frame the uh, survey thing that I'm going to fill in to be a little bit open ended, but also specific enough to be you know that would get some interest from students? Um, does that question make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I'm not exactly completely sure like what my advice would be. Um, would love to hear from Emily and Jack if you have thoughts on this. I mean, Colin, one thing that you might do, and everybody, uh, sometimes it can be helpful, especially if you, you know, if you know the joint and know who, you know, you know, know who to reach out to. In addition to submitting to the the, the, the you know the the topic uh, submission application. 
you can reach out to individual faculty who are involved in particular seminars. I mean, you know, we have like, uh, yeah, this, this if it's a you know BGP, you can you know reach out to John Haig. If it's uh, you know social and urban policy, you can reach out to Suzanne Cooper and possibly me. I might be working with Suzanne on that. Nothing wrong with uh, connecting. Okay. Exactly. That's good. Thank you. Other any other thoughts? I, I think just making sure that you're including like the rough policy area and yeah, research methods. Yeah. And okay. I think, you know, uh those two things, if they can be fairly um those two things, if, if they can be specific, you'll get a lot of students who might be interested in the combination of the two. Okay. But you're welcome Great. to reach Thank out you. to Emily and me to get the seminar advisors. Um, so who's in charge of each of them? Cool. Sounds good. Thank you. Read. Read, are you there? All right, we'll come back to you, Read. Turning to Hattie. Oh, Read, I saw you on mute. Are you there? Sorry about that. I just was um, getting coffee. Uh, but listening on my phone. So um, <clears throat> let me get situated. And um, the topic that I would like to raise is the topic that I worked on at the Kennedy School, which is health policy. And I'll come on video and say, hi, Jack Donahue. It's been 33 years since I've seen you. It's really wonderful that you all are doing this. So I've actually been applying what I learned at the Kennedy School um, <clears throat> for many years doing uh, health policy and clinical quality improvement in California. And our focus in a collaborative that I've built is called, our collaborative is called the California Right Care Initiative. And now that we've gone to the Zoom era, we can do things with federal partners as well. So my thought is <clears throat> one of the things that motivates, um, so we have had really great success using the Kennedy School strategies of using data to drive policy. And uh, what you see behind me is um, secular trend and then um, our pilot project uh, results are the lower lines where we lowered um, acute heart attack hospitalizations in uh, the county of San Diego by uh, 20 2% overall and 26% for women very quickly within two years of applying the knowledge um, of what prevents the number one killer uh, for people of uh, starting in their 30s. So it's a, there's a great deal of misunderstanding about um, how this impacts young people and people in the middle of their working life. So my thought for a PAE is to have a student who's really interested in health policy and cardiovascular disease being the number one killer for men and women starting in their 30s um, to start making the financial case, which we have not done yet. The data is now becoming easier to access. Um, and so I, um, I started this collaborative 17 years ago. We've been published in uh, two national journals for uh, this particular pilot project that was funded by the National Institutes of Health. So really what I would love help with is scaling this up and thinking through the federal agencies that can help us to do that. Because, um, We have amazing new medications that can prevent, frankly, most of the surgeries that are going on. Our current orientation is that um, we wait until somebody has an event, and an event meaning a heart attack, stroke, or diagnosis of heart failure, um, before instead of using what I call the mammogram of the heart, which costs about two to $300, uh, it's a quick 
heart CT scan. I've had it done a couple times myself. Uh, it, it detects whether or not you have subclinical atherosclerosis. So when there's a finding, as there is uh, for one in 20 uh, women age 45 of atherosclerosis, we have powerful medications and strategies, lifestyle and <clears throat> medical, to prevent the vast majority of these events. So we need to shift federal policy, and I need help with that strategy and laying out the financial ramifications because, frankly, we all know that the feds, to some extent, are a large HMO on um, on paying for a lot of these events in Medicaid and Medicare. Thank you for listening. Let me give a shot of that. By the way, I, the the uh, term I've heard for what you just described is the federal government is uh, an insurance company with an army, which is... Uh... Uh, if you look at where the money goes, that's a, not a bad description. Uh, you know, great question, and it actually gives uh, gives us an opportunity to define a distinction, which is really important. Um, what could be a great PAE is to say, you know, here's our mission. We need allies. Uh, what here are three possible strategies we could take to building a coalition. Uh, which is the most promising strategy in terms of the mission and the financial stakes of, of particular agencies. That would be great. What would be not so great, and I, and you know this, but just to be clear, uh, a version of that which would be not so great is, here's our mission and make basically make the marketing case for why our mission is so important and everybody should join with us. So... so I've been, I've built a huge coalition in California, which is now extending nationally. I have cardiologists all over the country working with me um, and medical directors. Um, what I don't have a good understanding of is the different, there are a lot of federal agencies involved in health. And um, there's a bizarre thing that's happened, which is the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force is saying they want to wait until there is a randomized control trial, which NIH refuses to fund because it's hugely expensive, uh, to make this a screening test like the mammogram of the heart. Yeah. Uh, so fine, use it as a diagnostic test, but they will not cover it, even though the data coming that supports this comes from the um, our astronauts, our military, our presidents all get this test. Yep. And it, it, I mean, the, the data is 30, 40 year old data that is stunning. If you do not have atherosclerosis, you're not going to have a heart attack or stroke. It's not going to happen. And we know how to find those people. So, how I do we that, shift the federal policy? That's the question, not how to build the federal coalition. An analysis that would say, which organizations are likely to be receptive to this? That would be great. Again, I think that say everybody should drop what they're doing and you know focus on this mission. That would that's that's a pure advocacy piece. And again, there's a place for that. PA isn't 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 it? So I really Thank need so help much, with the financial analysis uh, that includes not only the direct cost of the hospitalizations, but also uh, the, you know, a potential thing to consider, Jack, is that this impacts the African-American community worse than any other community. Uh, not that it doesn't affect every family in America. Uh, the advocacy, I've got that down. I, that's not an issue. I um, could really use help with the financial analysis, possibly just the direct financial analysis, uh, but also those externalities to communities when those young mothers and fathers are 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 killed early um, or die early when they're not no longer able to be breadwinners for their young families. Yep, that's the piece of what they could do. It's it's that's why we call it a policy analysis exercise. I think I think you got a sense of of where the the student could help. All right, let's turn to Reed. I feel like your, uh, we read that your microphone may be fixed. 
Yes. Can you hear me now? Is that working? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, I also don't have a webcam and I apologize. So I'm really tripping over my shoes on the technology here. Um, my question is about security clearances. So um, I know that probably eliminates a good number of the students right away, but in your experience, is it possible either to get a student who already has a US government security clearance or get them through the process to at least get an interim secret clearance? You know, I, I wish I knew the answer to this, but my guess is a fair number of our students actually do have have clearance. Um, we've got a lot of of you know currently serving and, and recent military officials. Um, it's been a while since I had clearance myself. Uh, if you had if they had to get it fresh for the PAE, I, the timing might be an issue. Yeah. Um, but. Emily, Kate, do you have this have a sense of what fraction of our students do have decently high? It's going to be some. There's going to be. It's some. going to be some. We okay. certainly have some active duty military. Um, act that it's possible. Um, you'd want to and really like emphasize that that is necessary in the um project proposal. Sure. Um, but I guess there'd be a lot of overlap between the students who have the clearance and those who would be qualified and interested in, in a security topic you define. Absolutely. I do want to mention one, you didn't ask this question, one thing that is, is worth mentioning. By ancient Harvard rules, academic products need to be publicly available in the library. And mm -hmm. so if it's like so sensitive that that would be, you know, a deal breaker, that, that's important. Now, sometimes you know, we, we can, you know, delay submission for a year if there's a good reason. Sometimes the uh, the students will submit uh, a version of the, of the uh, PAE for just for posting and grading purposes that, you know, eliminates the, you know, the most sensitive part. And then there'll be like a, a secure annex that goes just to the client. We, we've got a lot of experience in, in working our way around it, but if the whole thing is so sensitive that it can never become public, that's kind of not appropriate for PAE. No, that's sort of what I was envisioning. And I actually have a couple different policy questions that are potential options, but all of them, I think the person would have to have the classified context. Otherwise someone would be able to d dismiss whatever recommendation if it wasn't at least, you know, considered, you know, the uh, information on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and I would imagine some sort of like classified annex that accompanies and addresses those questions, but the majority would would certainly be a public, publicly available output um, is what I'm thinking right now, but thank you. Thank you, Reed. Let's turn to Rami. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, great. Um, Thanks for organizing this. I'm an MPP alum. I did my own PAE about 15 years ago at the Kennedy School. I think Monica Duffy Toft was the PAE seminar in those days. So that 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 will age me. Um, I've recently moved to the private sector, and I think I'm finally in a position to actually have a great PAE topic and participate. I've got three very quick and easy general questions that hopefully will be useful for others who might be joining from industry. Um, and I'll, I'll run through them super quickly. One is I've noticed all the projects I reviewed on the website from the last few years, I would say probably less than 10% of those are private industry clients. That seems obvious. Most of them are government agencies, international orgs. That's what I would expect you know, as an alum of the program. I'm just wondering, is that a reflection of like the number of clients that have come in to participate, a reflection of student interests who have decided which clients they want to work with? Or is it a reflection of just what has been posted on the website and what has not? I'm just wondering, is it even worth industry really focusing on this and submitting something? That's the first question. I mean, if, if it's a policy issue, there's not, it's completely fair game. Um, and, you know, we do have students who, you know, something that's becoming uh, popular in recent years is students who want to start their own company and they they basically will do, do a business plan. Um, so there's there's nothing wrong with that. Again, if it's if it's purely uh, you know business strategy without a policy angle, that's you know again, don't want to badmouth business strategy by any means, but we have a perfectly good business school across the river and they've got that covered. So but if it's a private sector project, 
uh, that hinges on a you know a, a policy analysis question, you know, go for it. Okay, awesome. Um, and we actually do work with the business schools of, of Cambridge on on yeah pretty similar end of year projects. I'm trying to pull in on the policy side of my alma mater. Um, on the this really touches back on Reed's question around national security, but it's looking at it from a, the private side. So. Um, who exactly owns the the IP here? And is there any sort of role for the client in case the students want to go and publish this on a website or what they've come up with? So beyond the library, um, do they do we have a sort of say in that or is it fully owned by the university at that point? And, you know, we just have to take whatever the findings are. That is a great question. And I think I'm judging by her face, Emily and I are both looking for the language that um, describes <laughs> there is some very precise language that our research librarians in the university have agreed on in terms of the um, IP. And um, I am working to put my hands on it, but of course, and now I have to dual confirm my identity. Um, I would say that uh, without having this language in front of me, it is going to be available to anyone with an HUID via the Harvard Libraries databases. So not to answer the ownership question, but to answer the sort of who has access to it. It's not just the entire world. It would be only folks who have um, Harvard credentials, what we call now a Harvard key, um, so that they could log in and actually access the, the, the finished product of the PAE. Um, Emily, I don't suppose you have that language in front of you, do you? I have the um, copyright information that I was going to share. So that's what I have yeah. pulled. Yeah. Can, um, you pull, can you put that in the chat? Just yeah. So I'll, I'll just put this in the chat. So um, it's about publishing the, the PAE just so everyone can see it. Oh, and there's another question in there. Sorry. I was sipping my coffee. Um, okay. So here is the section um, everybody can see about the, the copyright and how it's held by the student. Um, so you'll need the student's consent to publish it, um, and then they have to kind of add an additional piece to it saying that it was submitted in, you know, partial fulfillment of the MPP program. Um, and then the other piece here is that, um, the Harvard logo isn't able to be used since it's a relationship between a client and the student, um, and not the client and the school. So they have a pretty firm distinction there. Okay, all clear. Thanks for that. That's actually what the third and last question was, which was, um, is there like a template of what the relationship looks like between, I actually thought before that comment, I thought this is going to be like a relationship between the client and the university with some sort of contract that gets signed. I see nodding. So Harvard Kennedy School, there's no paperwork that is binding a client to the university. It's just a sort of informal, it's an informal relationship. Am I understanding correctly? My legal team will ask me all these questions, I promise you. <laughs> Sorry for the, the detailed question. I've dealt with them in the past. Uh, no apologies necessary. This comes up all the time, actually. Um, the relationship between students and clients has been getting more and more complicated uh, over the years as you know, larger and larger data sets are shared between client and student. Um, so yeah. they're there has been, um, there have been a lot of clients who've been asking students to sign things like contracts and MOUs. Um, and full disclosure, we strongly advise students against signing anything because they're signing as an individual. They're taking on whatever liability or risk as an individual. Um, but we have come up with a, um, a sort of client agreement template, which does start to get at some of those questions. Um, I know we link to it, but from our own intranet, I don't believe we link to it in a place where you would have access to it, Rami. But if you wanted to email me, um, I, I can put my email in the chat and I can send you a copy of it. Um, yes, yes, please. We are very familiar. I mean, it does come up that you know where the opera, you know, where the client is fine, the student's fine, we're fine, and the clients. Legal department is getting squirrely, and we we usually can work that out. Got it. Okay, so this is not an academic partnership at all. This is really just uh, you know support for students who happen to be within an academic domain. Okay, all clear. That's all for me. Thanks very much. All right, David. 
Hi, thank you. Um, I did my PA as an MPP in 1992. Um, just a little background. Um, thank you. I have a couple of just uh, uh, questions about what's going on at the, at the K-School now. Um, the topic I'm primarily interested in getting some help from a student with is at the intersection of three fields, the economics of three fields, and I'm kind of wondering how active the school is. Uh, it would be environmental economics, agricultural economics, and health healthcare economics. Is the school still active in all three of those areas, more or less? Not so much? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, environmental, for sure, big time. Uh, health, absolutely. Yeah. In agriculture, we just we're uh, we're just we just hired an agricultural uh, policy expert. So uh, well, I don't know. Okay. If, yeah, we, yeah. We, no, that that's helpful. Just to, just to steer me in the right direction. Um, uh, I think that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Paul Graven, uh, MPP eighty nine. Um, yeah, I. Oh, just. Uh, anecdotally about the security clearance stuff, my spring exercise, I spent a couple of days at the Pentagon. I had clearances from my company and all that and interviewed people on classified stuff and then created an unclassified uh, study. Um, so that is, is seems fully workable. Um, and that was a few years back. Um, anyway, uh, my topic right now that I'm just, I think that there's got to be a way to turn, to create a PAE where we've been working with the Air Force and the Space Force on the supply chain um, for spacecraft and just this problem that um, it takes sometimes, you know, five or more years to build a spacecraft. And a lot of that is driven by um, uh, supply chain challenges. And we did some studies sponsored by the Air Force and Space Force a few years back, basically suggesting that there may be a billion dollar mm -hmm. underinvestment in inventory in the space supply chain. We think and we, uh, we believe there's a market failure that's causing that. Everybody's yelling at everybody about trying to go faster. Nobody's doing it. Um, we have a lot of data. We've interviewed a hundred companies about it. We really, I think we know like what, kind of what's going on, but I think there's a PAE in there somewhere. We have, we've actually created a company. We think we have a mechanism where a third party can go in and make some of those investments. So we think we have an idea about that. Um, but we haven't really put a fine point on the whole market failure problem. And then, so, you know, validate sort of the nature and causes of the market failure and then, you know, look at our, you know, sort of our industry-based solution to see if that seems like it's helpful and valid. But then also look at what are the other sort of policy stuff, right? I'm, you know, I'm fully supportive. I don't need somebody to go do my company's work. But I think that there's a good sort of road to hoe here for somebody if they're interested. And I just kind of wanted to see how do, how do I get from here to there? I mean, in some ways trying to figure out what the binding constraint is on a publicly vital question as you described that's that's like dictionary illustration of a great PAE topic uh, the one thing you'd, you'd have to be open to the possibility that they that the conclusion the student comes comes up with is that you know your commercial solution isn't the right isn't the right policy action they, it does it sure. doesn't. but uh you know, actually, uh, I would say, I mean, we do, we still, we always have, and still do uh, a great job on training the students in economic analysis. And so, finding the, you know, the not just surveying the the, the market landscape, but finding the crucial bottleneck is something they tend to be really good at. Um, so, I think that would be a, that could be a great topic. So, if that's a yeah, if that if that would work for a PAE, then that that I, I think that's straightforward, and that would be. Oh, that would be great. Okay. Well, I'll get my, I'll, I'll get to work on writing it up. Thank you. We have eight minutes left in the hour, probably time enough for a couple of questions. Um, if anyone wants to raise their hand or we have questions in the chat, I've seen a couple people ask for um, a link to the form that you submit for the PAE client project. Um, 
we can make sure that that goes out to everybody who was here today afterwards. And I think it's in the chat in a couple of places, um, but that's an easy thing for us to send out. Um, Hattie. Hi again. So would you mind talking a little bit about the process between the student and the uh, Kennedy School faculty that they'll be working with, for instance, if it's health economics, uh, and, and then what uh, my role would be with that student, how much time, like, could we have like a an hour long meeting once a week as an expectation to sort of view progress and discuss things or uh, I do have a pretty busy job and that's my one hesitation. That, I would say an hour a week has never happened uh, for, you know, an hour every single week while they're doing it. That's just, that is not, that's, that asks way too much of the client. So I, I don't think that's something you should worry about. Okay. As, as Kate indicated, it's, it's, it's quite uneven. Uh, right. You know, upfront defining the, you know, defining the exact policy problem uh identifying what data is required you know, kind of be, being the concierge for the student with the rest of your organization to get the data that the, the first you know couple of weeks would often be somewhat more intensive but there would be long stretches of time when you know the typical engagement with the client would be you know just a few emails to to you know check facts uh but up front there's a lot of involvement as it gets closer to com to completion, as the students are drafting, sometimes there's a little bit more, but it's not anything like uh, you know, a, I mean, it's not like supervising a you know uh, an employee where you okay. And then, do the PAE uh, students sometimes go to work for the PAE client? I know that that um, was the case when I did mine. Happens all the time. Yep. Right. It's best case scenario, really. Well, we're very excited about um, the ability to save our country significant funds and reduce uh, the trauma that's happening to families that we now know how to prevent. But making the economic case more broadly to the federal government is not something that we've had the bandwidth or, you know, really the experience to know how to tackle. Hattie, well, I hope we can be helpful with that. Maybe one more Thank question. You. Well, thank you all so much for coming today. So wonderful to see so many alumni um, considering getting involved in this way. Please don't hesitate to reach out um, uh, if you have questions or if you, you know, just want to workshop something quickly before you submit your proposal. Um, we are happy to be part of that process. Um, the alumni engagement team will email all of you with um, the slide deck and a link to the page that has information about becoming a client as well as a link to the um, to the form. Um, and we really hope to, that you'll get involved. Uh, it's an exciting process. It's a great way to stay involved with the community. It's a great way to have really smart people looking at a uh, complicated problem in your organization. Um, let's see, Karen and Kristen, is there anything that you would like us to do to wrap up here? If there are no questions left, of course. No, thank you all, Kate, Jack, and Emily. Thank you so much um, for doing this presentation today and for really educating our alumni about this wonderful opportunity that really helps um, the current students on campus. So thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to keeping you engaged um, in the future months. For the most up-to-date school news and events, please visit the HKS website. And as Kate mentioned, we will send a follow-up email for everyone that's on this call and those that registered um, with a recording um, and the information um, that you've requested in the chat. We captured that as well, just so we don't miss anything. Thank you all so much. Thank you. This is exciting. Thank you so much. Bye.